This is Stacy Eldridge. Welcome to Captivated. This world vies for our attention in a thousand different ways. But the most important thing, the preeminent thing, the essential thing, is to give our attention to Jesus. Welcome, friends. Stacy here. I want to start by reading the scripture to you because this is my prayer. It's Paul's prayer in Colossians 1. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And my favorite, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Yes and amen. May the truth of that wash over you today as you listen. So today, I have a wonderful guest with me who is a woman I love, though we've never actually met yet. Her name is Katie Davis Majors, and I encourage you to get comfortable, settle in, and open your heart to receive such goodness. Let me tell you just a little bit more about this woman who has a deep passion to follow Jesus before we talk. She is a wife, a mother, a lover of God, along with many other things, and a New York Times bestselling author. In her first book, Kisses from Katie, a story of relentless love and redemption, she tells her beautiful and inspiring story. Katie moved to Uganda at 18 years old from Nashville following a short-term mission trip. It's close to two decades ago with no idea that it would be the place that God chose to build her home and her family. She gave up every comfort and convenience to become the adoptive mother to 13 girls. Kisses from Katie is filled with the joys and difficulties she lived and pressed into God for. Hers is an incredible story that I highly, highly encourage you to read. Today, she is wife to Benji and mom to her 15 favorite people. In her second book, Daring to Hope, Finding God's Goodness in the Broken and the Beautiful, she shares that after an unexpected tragedy shook her family, for the first time she began to wonder, is God really good? Does he really love us? I know you all relate to having times when those questions come. When Katie turned to God with her questions, he spoke truth to her heart and drew her even deeper into relationship with him. Katie also has authored a beautiful devotional called Our Faithful God Devotional. It's 52 weeks of leaning on the unchanging character. It's rich in scripture and practical application and the beauty that comes from following Jesus. You can tell that I love all her work, but today we're going to be talking about her new book just out called Safe All Along, Trading Our Fears and Anxieties for God's Unshakable Peace. And let me tell you, it's excellent. Her storytelling is captivating, honest, and relatable. She's compelling in her writing, and this book is filled with wisdom and practical application, all leading us to Jesus, all based on the scriptures, all filled with deep hope. It's so, so good, Katie. Katie, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I am looking forward to talking about Safe All Along. But before we do, could I just ask you a few questions about your walk with God? I I know we're so encouraged hearing each other's personal stories. Can you share about your journey of faith with him? Have you always walked with him? I have walked with him from a very young age. Mm. Um, as I, 
as I look back over my life, you know, my, my parents are people of deep faith and I was raised in the church and that was a beautiful experience for me. I know that's mm. not everybody's story, but in God's mercy, um, the church was a place of safety and refuge for me and a place where I felt that I really heard his voice from Mm. a very young age. And so um, I don't have a memory of not knowing at least who God was, but also feeling him very near to me. Uh, That became a lot more real to me when I was a young teenager. Um, A couple people that I loved very much uh, died in kind of quick succession Mm. and I don't remember anybody telling me that my Bible was where I would find solace, but I knew, uh, and I believe that that was the Holy Spirit prompting me before I had the language to call that the Holy Spirit. um, I knew that scripture was where I wanted to turn with my grief. And again, Mm -hmm. I attribute that only to God's mercy and grace, um, that I was drawn to the Psalms and I feel that in the Psalms, I learned to pray. Uh, And then um, when I was in high school, definitely uh, God brought a woman into my life who just wanted to mentor me, who loved his word and spoke about Jesus as if um, he were her very best friend, you know, someone who just like came over and sat with her and talked with her. And I just... I wanted that. I wanted yes. more of that. And so I um, feel very fortunate um, and very protected by God that he has put that in my life and my heart from a very young age. Um, and then when I was 18, my mom and I went on a three-week mission trip to Uganda. And I I fell in love with the people there. I fell in love with just the beautiful hospitable culture. Um, and I, I felt that God, God's voice, I experienced God's voice in my heart as a little bit louder and a Uh. little bit clearer in that space. And so I had a deep desire to go back as we were leaving Uganda, a Ugandan pastor and his wife, who we had been introduced to during our time there invited me to come back and live in their home with them for a year and, (gasps) and help them and serve in their orphanage. And, um, I was kind of on this typical American high schooler track. I had applied to colleges. I had gotten in. I I kind of knew what I wanted my life to look like. Um, But as I came back, I think my mom probably knew the moment they invited me that I was going to do it. I (laughs) kind of was like, oh, I don't know. I'll think about it. (laughs) But I came back and ultimately decided to say yes to that invitation and take kind of a gap year in between um, high school and college. And so after I graduated from high school, I moved to Uganda um, for what I thought would be a year and what really turned into my entire adult life. Um, Wow. And definitely, I mean, just experienced God in so, so many ways. I think... um, even as you kind of read the biographies of the few books that I've written, it was I was just remembering uh, the way I think God so often strips things away from us, yeah. not at all, not at all with any kind of malicious intent, but um, I think He prunes us so that we can experience more and more of Him, and so that we can move closer and closer to him and deeper and deeper into his heart. And I would say that's really been like the experience of my entire adult life is that he has poured out incredible, incredible blessings and joy. And he's also walked me and my family through some really deep, dark, hard places. Mm. But in that he's been, he's been so near Yes. to me and to us and he's been uh showing me more of his character and more of who he is and so that's that's what I love to write about that's what I love to talk about anytime I get a chance is just what a incredibly present god that we have um and how we can you know we can just 
we can always experience more of him, right? Like he's so vast and so expansive and so limitless that there's just like always more of his heart to learn and to know and experience. And I think that that's the most exciting thing that we could ever do in this life, right? And it's it's funny because it's such a hidden unseen thing right like there's so much external that doesn't shift as we go deeper into the heart of god it's such an internal shift but um gosh it's just so miraculous that we get to experience him the way that we do it is it's just the best this is why um I'm just so drawn to your writing and why other people's are and why it's like, oh, go, you guys get it because it's, it's real. You're real about the spectrum of life, the tragedy and the beauty and the faithfulness of God in the midst of all of it and how we get to know him even more deeply in the hard times, but also that we get to never stop getting to know him and his beauty and and who he is and just get so captured by him over and over again. I was going to ask you um, about a hard question, but I think you already answered it. But if you want to put more words to it, just what are, what are some of the things that you love about Jesus the most? Ooh, Isn't that a hard a one? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a hard one. The most. Um, I'm studying Hebrews right now, and right at the very beginning of Hebrews, the author says that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature and the radiance of his glory. And so that's been something I've been thinking about a lot um, the most. I I, I love Jesus. (laughs) I I love his kindness Mm. and his compassion and his mercy. I think even as a young person that drew me to him, I think he put in me um, a unique bent toward mercy and compassion. And so to see that in him, in the way that he stopped and cared for people that the rest of the world might might not naturally be bent toward um, really, really stood out to me and drew me to Jesus. And just as I've been thinking of the fact that Jesus in human form is the exact reflection Mm. of the character Mm. of my father god um i've just been thinking a lot about the father's kindness and compassion and mercy toward me and that the way that we see jesus so compassionately interact with others is the way that god the father desires to so compassionately and kindly and tenderly interact with us. And so that's something that I've been experiencing more deeply in mm-hmm. this season and mm-hmm. really loving. Uh, another another character of Jesus that I've always loved is just this idea of Emmanuel, God, with yes. us. That he yes. is with us, that he is never far off. Um, he, he's never far removed. Like he's just, he's with me in all of it. And so, um, as I come to him, as I cry out to him, he's not getting closer to me because I'm praying to him or because I'm calling out to him, but, but I am opening myself up to the withness that is already available to me all the time. And I just think, gosh, I think that is so incredible. <laughs> My heart is, um, it's burning inside me as you speak, just the beauty of the reality of his goodness and the way he represents the father, how we get to know if you've seen me, you've seen the father, like, wow. I know, um, This just spurs my own imagination on to how fabulous he is. You're fabulous, Mm -hmm. God. Um, Hey, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the ministry that you began in Uganda. Amazina, is that how you? Amazima. Amazima. Um, It's tricky. It's tricky. Uh, Amazima is the Luganda word for truth. And Mm. so when I founded this ministry, 
gosh, what, 18 ish years ago. That's crazy to say out loud, but um, that was my heart's desire, right? I, God kept bringing me to um, in John where Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And just my desire to see the people that Amazima serves be set free in the truth of God's word mm. and in the truth of who he is. So I'll take us back a little bit. I was I was spending that year living and working with just the most kind and generous couple and falling in love. They had an orphanage on the compound where they lived and there were about 120 children and they really only had eight or nine staff members. Oh my and goodness. So it was super understaffed. It was very underfunded. Um, they didn't have a lot of resources for these children. And so I had started trying to, you know, kind of call home and raise some awareness and raise some resources for these kids. And as I got to know the kids better, um, a lot of them started talking to me about their families. And I came to find out that a lot of them had living parents, living grandparents, aunts, uncles, people in the community that they loved. And that was a little bit of a mind shift for me as an American with no exposure to mm. East Africa. Mm -hmm. I think I had assumed that the children who lived in the orphanage, you know, their parents had probably died or mm -hmm. maybe their parents didn't want them. And that does happen. But by and large in East Africa, the most recent statistic I've seen is that 80 to 85 percent of children living in institutionalized care actually have at least one living parent. Mm. And um, it's poverty is the reason yes. that that parents send their children to live somewhere else. School is by and large not free in East Africa. And so um, it's very expensive to send a child to school, especially if you have multiple children, mm. especially as the children get older, the higher and higher they go in school, the more expensive it becomes. Um, and so there are just a lot of parents who really believe that their child would have a better life and access to education if they send them to live somewhere else. And so that just really was heartbreaking to me. Mm. And, and I, you know, as I just began to ask the friends I was making in the community and learn more, I realized that for what to me felt like a very small amount of money, you know, something around like $50 a month would be enough to provide a child with education and food and some medical care. And so there was a woman that lived down the street from me. She was a grandmother and she had twin daughters and they were getting, you know, they were five or six years old. They were getting to the age where they needed to start school mm -hmm. and she wasn't going to be able to afford it. Mm. And so she was contemplating sending her grandchildren to live away from her at mm -hmm. the orphanage. And I just asked the question, well, what if I pay for them to go to school? Then, then would you want them to stay and live with you? And she said, yes, of course. Um, wow. with tears in her eyes. She was so mm. overjoyed. So, you know, I called my parents and was like, hey, I need a couple hundred dollars, please. <laughs> yes. Um, and honestly, that just, those were the first two children that I paid for to go to school. And through word of mouth, that just kind of spread. I had some trusted friends in the community that began to lead me and introduce me to people who were in a similar situation. And I would call my friends and family back here in the United States and say, hey, do you do you want to help me like change someone's life? And so within the first year that I lived in Uganda, I was collecting money from friends and family to pay for 40 children to be able to go to school, have multiple nutritious meals a day, wow. but most of all to stay in their home and mm. in their community. Mm. And um I just, I mean, I really felt God impress upon me that this was not a one-year thing. This was going to be my life's work. And so um, founded the nonprofit Amazima. That was so, so many years ago. We have grown and grown and grown. I have the most incredible uh, majority Ugandan staff, and they um, just do a fantastic job running our programs. We now have multiple schools in Uganda where 
so we started just paying for children to go to school in the local community schools and eventually we ended up building our own schools because we realized just the vast amount of time that you have with children during the school day um, by which we don't want to just educate them we really want them to we want to teach them the truth of yes. who Jesus is. We want them to become disciples of him. We want them to be young people who then go back into their communities and share the truth of God's word and his character. And so it's been super exciting. We've got hundreds of students that come to our schools and by extension, thousands of families that we impact in the community. And um our goal is to provide them, yes, with education and medical care and nutrition and job skills and all the things they need for a flourishing life, but most importantly, to point them to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. Friends, if you want to learn more about Amazima, it's going to be in the show notes because, uh, yeah, they have needs and they have room for growth. And if that pricks you, learn more because it's beautiful. All right, I'm shifting to your book, Safe All Along. So when you open the book, you tell a story that is that is riveting. And I'm wondering if you would mind sharing that now with us. I would love to. Oh, good. Um, Thank you. Because it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was a clear, um, I don't have these moments all the time, but that was definitely a clear moment where I felt that God gave me a picture and gave mm. me oh, some words for it in my heart and in my spirit. And so, um, I guess I'll, I'll start off by saying that our family had been battling some very difficult things, specifically a really challenging medical diagnosis. And um, that had just launched me for the first time um, into a, an experience of really deep anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I mean, full gamut, panic attacks and mm -hmm. awake in the middle of the night. And anybody who's ever experienced deep anxiety or depression um or have, can can kind of relate to this and i was i was doing all the things right i was in mm -hmm. i was in therapy and i was taking medication and i i mean i think that all god gives us all different kinds of tools and resources to help and so um I like to say that on the front end of yes. talking about anxiety, yes. uh, that there are so many tools and so many things that God has used to really help me along the way. But all that to say, it had been a really anxious, really challenging season for me and for our family. Mm -hmm. And then for a few months, as we had sent um, several of our oldest children had started going to university in the United States. Okay. And so that had been a part of the challenge as well, was this is the first time that our family was on two continents. Mm -hmm. And then there was the pandemic in the middle of it. I mean, it was just, it was a hard, it was many things. <sighs> That's a lot. Um, stacked up. But our oldest children were home from college on a break and we were able to go on this camping trip together at one of our favorite places right along the Nile River. And we were just having the best time and it was so joy filled. And the first morning that we were there, one of my adult daughters and I decided to jump in and swim in the river. You know, we had on life jackets. It was something that we had done many times before. And from the river bank, the current was very strong and there was a sign that said, do not swim here. Um, but from the bank, it really looked like the current was a circle. And so you would jump in and it would come around and spit you back yes. out on the shore. Yes. So we felt pretty, we were both strong swimmers. We felt confident. We jumped in to have some fun and about halfway through, I don't know if we overshot it or if the current shifted mm. as rivers can do, but we found ourselves stuck in this rapid being pulled very quickly away from the shore. And mm. so, as you can imagine, any mother's worst nightmare. Yes. I mean, it was it was like a scene out of a movie. Like, you could not have scripted it to be more intense. So I'm in the water. You know, it's foamy and white and I can hardly see. And with one arm, I'm like swimming frantically, trying to get to shore. And with the other arm, 
I'm reaching out for my daughter and I was finally able to grab a hold of a branch and kind of okay, I'm going to pause myself. you right there because weren't you told yeah. as well that there were falls up ahead? Like, yes. So my husband just like totally jokingly ah. had said like, oh, you know, there's some falls up ahead. So be careful. Right. I mean, we all didn't think anything would really happen. Right. So yes, the picture in my mind is like, we're, we're going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm finally able to pull myself up on the bank and I'm reaching out my arm and I just, I cannot reach my daughter and I watch her go around this corner and I can't see her and I can't do anything. So I pull myself up on this rock. I'm looking back to where our family is. Nobody seems to be moving very quickly. Like we're quite far away now. I'm waving my arms, trying to like, I don't know, alert them to something. Like I'm okay, but maybe she's not. Yes. And I just sat down on the rock and just began to cry and cry out to Jesus, Lord, please save her. And of course, my mind is just filled with dread and anxiety and imagining every worst case Mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sat there on that rock for a little bit, just praying harder than I've ever prayed, just begging God and... My husband and a few of our children approached from one side, and then I heard footsteps coming from the other side. Uh. And I saw her swimsuit was yellow, and I saw little peaks of her yellow swimsuit. And then she oh. was there. She had gotten out. She was okay. And so, you know, of course, I'm screaming and crying and hugging her, and she's all very nonchalant about it. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fine, Mom. You know, she kind of hopped off and joked with her sisters, like, "Uh, maybe we won't go swimming anymore today. But I finally, you know, it was, I finally made it up the hill to where my husband was and just like fell into his arms sobbing. And, you know, I'm so sorry. I thought we lost her. And he said, hey, I want to show you something. And he walked me a little bit further up up the riverbank and around the corner and way up high there was this one spot that overlooked just this vast expanse of river and from way up high you could see all the twists and turns and he just began kind of pointing out to me like oh look there's that little island where where she could have swam up and oh Mm. here's a little a little cove where the river's still. Maybe she could have gotten out there. And he just kind of showed me all the different twists and turns and all the opportunities that she would have had to get to safety. And the words that dropped into my head were just, oh, we were safe Mm -hmm. all along. And I felt like in that moment, God just had me look back over the last couple years wow. of my life. Yes. And and I felt that I had been kind of metaphorically in the river, in the rapids, right? Where at eye level, all I could see was chaos mm-hmm. and disaster. Mm-hmm. And I had lived in that space for a couple years of my life just anticipating disaster and wondering what was going to happen and wondering what was up ahead and living in so much panic. And I felt like he was showing me, hey, this is what it looks like for me, God, right? Uh. Me, your loving father. I I see all the twists and turns. I see the places where it's going to be really challenging. And I see the places where I'm going to give you rest. Mm. And I see the people that I'm going to bring alongside you to love you and to help you through. And and I am going to keep you safe because you are in my hands. And I kind of laughed because once I saw how safe it was, I wanted to do it again. I thought like, (laughs) man, if I had not thought that this was going to end disastrously, that could have been kind of fun. Yeah. (laughs) Wild, but fun. And I, I wondered in that moment how much joy mm. 
I had missed in the last few years of my life because I was so stuck in panic mode and I was so full of dread and anxiety and just, um, yeah, just, just felt in that moment deeply safe and wanted to, wanted to endeavor to learn how to live out of, out of that peace that God gave me just in that moment where I not just intellectually believed that I was safe with him, but in my body and in my heart, I felt that I was truly safe. Mm -hmm. I think, um, as somebody who grew up as a Christian, that's, that can be my wrestle sometimes is intellectually in my brain. I know the right answers. Mm -hmm. I can tell myself about God's good and perfect plan, right? I can answer myself with scripture. Um, but I want to not just know in my head, no, I want to experience it yes. deeply. And I want to live out of that experience so that people who interact with me are also experiencing that from me. And so, um, and I believe that God calls us into that, but like only he can equip us to do that. And so I spent the next year or so just studying God's peace. What do the scriptures say about peace? What is peace? What is peace as the world defines it? And what is like actual deep Mm. peace where like I can walk through any storm and not be shaken because I have a different supernatural peace. And God is so kind because what I did not know, oh, I get teary thinking about it. What I did not know was that we were actually about to walk into a season that was even harder mm-hmm. than where we had been before mm-hmm. um, within the next couple of months. Wow. Um, there, wow. there were more medical things going on in our family Um, There were a lot more closures and different travel bans coming up due to COVID. And ultimately, at the end of that year, our family unexpectedly moved to the United States. I mean, that was like never in the plan. Yes. Never in the cards for us. And we found ourselves here unable to go back Mm. to Uganda. We found ourselves in the States on what was supposed to be a three-week trip and unable to return for various reasons. And God, in his kindness to me, had had me studying his peace because I thought I wanted to write a book about it. And then in the middle of that year was like, oh, gosh, I can't write a book about it. My whole life is upside down. I don't even know what this means. And so Safe All Along was really written from a place and a posture of not an expert, not coming at it from a place of this is something I've already learned and want to share with you, but really coming at it from a place of, no, this is something that I believe God promises us. And so I desire to learn how to live in his peace. Mm, mm, That's so good. You you share a, a lot about the unexpected and unwanted stay mm. back in the United States. That was really hard. And you you wrote about the encouragement where he said, plant, dwell. I want to read this little bit. You write, he said, plant here where you are today, not because you know what the fruit will be, not because you know if you are here long-term or not, but because you are here now and you are alive and you are part of something bigger than yourself namely living alongside other things that live and grow by God's grace alone. I, I really resonated with that, that be here now. And I was, I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit more. Ah, I mean, I think a lot of us, myself specifically are so, so bent on figuring out what's next and what's coming and what's up ahead. And I, I'm a planner. And so I like to plan. I like to know what's up ahead so that I can plan for it. And I realized that, um, that was causing me to kind of live in the future a lot in the first many months of my being here. I, I was really just like 
all I cared about was when we would be able to get back to Uganda. And we have since been able to travel back many times and, and see our loved ones there. But we've also felt that uh, God has just made it clear um, in many ways through many circumstances that we're to be here in the U.S. for now. And I, I felt that really the only way to do that and live at peace was to start to put some roots down mm -hmm. and really kind of be present and focus on the task at hand. And that is that is a way that we practice trust. You know, I, I think that being present to what's in front of us today is a way that we practice and declare our trust in God to take care of what is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think that it is a way that we worship him by saying, okay, God, I want to worship you in doing well the thing that you have put in front of me and in being a light in my home, in my community today. And as I focus on that, I can trust you to take care of what is up ahead of it. And I mean, that is easier said than done for me for sure, but that has just grown in me a place of trust because truly we're not promised tomorrow. And so, yes, we can plan to some extent and we can ask God for wisdom as we make decisions that are up ahead of us. But to get stuck there and to just dwell there and to fix our thoughts and, and our minds on all these future things when God is giving us good gifts and good work to do today um, and his provision, right? He provides for us today. I've right. always loved the picture of the Israelites in the desert receiving yes. manna because yeah. he provides for us today what we need for today. And so why am I so worried that he won't provide what I need for tomorrow? One, I have a lifetime of experience of God providing for me what I need today. Mm -hmm. Why am I so worried that he won't provide what I need tomorrow? But also, I don't need to set my heart and my mind there. I I need to practice setting my heart and my mind on this conversation, this thing that's in front of me, this task that he's called me to today, and know that he's with yes. me in it. Yes. Oh, that's so good. He's in the now. He's right here. Mm. Yeah. So Katie, we're going to turn in a corner to close. Is there, is there anything else that you would like to say to the people listening? Oh goodness. I could, I mean, I could talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, <laughs> um, <laughs> but gosh, I just, if anything, it's just that, um, the testimony of my entire life is just that we serve a good and kind and merciful and trustworthy father. Yes. And I just, I pray that as people listen to these words, that that's, that that's what comes through is that no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what your experience is, that God is kind and he is yes. trustworthy and yes. he loves us so deeply. Oh, so good. Oh, marinate your heart in that truth, friends. Again, I'm going to put all of the ways that you can dive into more with Katie in the show notes. But as you know, the listeners that we're talking to right now are all in different places. You know, may, maybe they are living in the future or they are in a really tough season. Or maybe they are forgetting the things that they once knew about God or maybe they never did and he wants to reveal them to them. So I'm. can you close our time and just praying? For those that are listening. I'd love to. Oh, thanks. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for who you are and that we get to talk about who you are and that we get to know who you are and um, that we can never know all of who you are, God, but that we can continue all our lives yes. to know more and more and more of you, Lord. So I pray for everyone who will hear the sound of my voice. Lord Jesus, um, wherever they are, whoever they are, Father, if they've, uh, if they've known you for a very long time or if they've never known you at all or if they're somewhere in between, I pray, Lord, that they would feel and know and experience deep in their hearts 
a love that does not make sense Mm. to our human understanding. I pray that they would hear a still, small voice that says that they are your son or daughter and that they are deeply loved, God. Would you help us to trust you, God? We cannot do it on our own. Lord, um, we want to believe. We want to trust you, but we need you to help us. God, give us that gift of being able to lean on you, Lord. We just thank you that we can come to you because of our King, because of our Savior, Jesus. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Ah, Amen. Oh my goodness. Thank you. What a joy to be with you. Thank what, you. You too. I've enjoyed it. Good, good. And what a gift to be with you, friends, all you that are listening in. I just want to bless you, you who have captivated the King's heart. Till next time. Hi, everyone. This is Stacy Burton, the producer of the Captivated Podcast. If you've been a regular listener, you've heard the encouraging teachings offered and the incredible conversations Stacy has had with her guests. So wherever you listen, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. May you be filled with the goodness of his love today, and we look forward to having you join us next time. Thank you.